If it be true that the lessons of the past are the richest heritage of the present, then we have much to be thankful for. Ungrateful would it be to forget the years of patient endeavor, self-sacrifice, and zeal which our founders passed. Nestled against the foothills of Maryland's Catoctin Mountains is Mount St. Mary's University. Founded in 1808 by John Dubois, the Mount has played a unique part in the history of our country and a significant role in the development of the Catholic Church in America. As the Mount looks back on 200 years of history, they pause to celebrate how the school has been a refuge for saints, a place of education and inspiration for students. home of a seminary that has prepared thousands of young men for the priesthood, and the location of the national shrine, Grotto of Lords. The history of Mount St. Mary's would not be complete without examining its beginning within the context of America's founding colonies. In 1634, the Ark and the Dove landed in the Chesapeake Bay on St. Clements. The pilgrims were led by Father Andrew White and Leonard Calvert, whose mission it was to establish a colony that would be a refuge for religious freedom. They called their settlement Maryland. Immigrants flocked to this new colony. For Catholics, however, their hopes of openly practicing their faith were short-lived. In the 18th century, all sorts of penal laws were enforced against the Catholics. Uh, you couldn't read the law, you couldn't educate your child in a Catholic school, you couldn't even carry guns. Fairly early in the colony's history, many of the settlers decided to leave Southern Maryland and follow the Potomac River into the Western wilderness. The elders and other allied families moved up from the counties to uh, this valley, and they're actually the ones that named it the Mountain of St. Mary. Uh, it was a, a very difficult time for practicing Catholics, and perhaps that's part of the motivation that brought them to a place that had less accountability. This was truly the wilds in those days. In 1791, Father John Dubois arrived in this country. He was fleeing persecution, or perhaps death, from his French countrymen in the madness of the French Revolution. He was one of the first people to leave France in the 1790s when the revolution began to put pressure on priests. They would have had to swear allegiance to the revolution and become uh, employees of the state there. He chose to come here. He had letters of introduction, it is said, from Lafayette, and uh, so he was received by the first families of Virginia. Another, perhaps, legend is that he taught Patrick Henry's children uh, French, and in turn, uh, Patrick Henry sharpened his English. A few years after his arrival on American soil, Father Dubois was appointed pastor of a growing region in Western Maryland, known today as Frederick. He found that there was no church for his congregation. Because of the penal laws in uh, late colonial Maryland, uh, Catholics could go to mass, but they couldn't have a church or anything that looked like a church. So you couldn't have a steeple or a belfry or a spire. Uh, nothing that smacked of uh, the externals of Catholic worship. Only with the coming of the Revolution and the Declaration of Independence were Catholics allowed public worship again. Dubois set about the challenging task of building the first church for his congregation. In 1800, he laid the cornerstone for St. John's Catholic Church. In the early 1800s, this was a sort of a prosperous time and Frederick County in general, Washington County to our west were growing areas, lots of people moving in. Some of them owned land up here, they bought land and they were coming to this area and 
establishing new farms, in some cases uh, taking advantage of other local opportunities. There were ironworks, so sawmills, grist mills. This was a sort of bustling little industrial area. Not far from Frederick, in a small town called Emmitsburg, the roots of another Catholic community were beginning to take hold. Dubois would travel there as a circuit rider to celebrate mass for the English and Irish communities. He grew to love the majesty and tranquility of the mountains there, and in 1805 decided to unite the two congregations into one by building a church on the top of St. Mary's Mountain. Not long thereafter, Dubois left Frederick and moved into a small log cabin just below his church on the hill. He opened a small school for local boys, but his more challenging goal was to build a college and seminary for men. He went to uh, America's first archbishop, Archbishop John Carroll, who was in Baltimore, and told Carroll uh, what he wanted to do. And Carroll supposedly said to him, well, you know, we've just established Catholic College uh, within the last few years at Georgetown. And uh, I rather doubt we can sustain two Catholic colleges in this country, and I really can't give you much support. Not one to be easily deterred, Dubois proceeded without the support of Archbishop Carroll. And by 1808, he had assumed the responsibility as president of a school and seminary they called Mount St. Mary's. The response to this endeavor was quite positive, and by the end of the first year, there were 47 young men enrolled in the school. Tuition per student was $80 a year, a hefty sum that few could afford. Nonetheless, Dubois continued to acquire more land for the campus, and additional buildings and barns were added to the property. Mount St. Mary's had hardly opened their doors when word arrived that a young widow from New York, Elizabeth Ann Seton, was coming to the valley with a small group of women to establish a school for girls. Samuel Sutherland uh, Cooper, who was a retiring uh, sea captain from Virginia, came up with the money to buy the Fleming farmhouse across the road here down in the valley for her. When they arrived in Emmitsburg, the old house on the land, the old Fleming farmhouse was not yet ready for habitation. So the women came up to St. Mary's Mountain and accepted the hospitality of Father Dubois, who moved out of his cabin and into the unfinished school building. And the women moved in to the cabin for approximately six weeks while work was being done on the stone house uh, down in the valley that she named St. Joseph's Valley. Father Dubois became a lifelong friend to Mother Seton and her new community of religious women. Father Dubois was an everyday presence to the sisters, a regular presence. He would come across the field regardless of the weather, and sometimes the evidence of the frost and the bitter cold would be very apparent on his face. He really assumed the role of being the regular chaplain for the sisters from the beginning. He would say mass regularly. On Sundays, the sisters would make the journey up the mountain to attend mass at the church on the hill. Father Dubois eventually became superior to the new order of sisters and remained so for the next 15 years. By 1811, Mount St. Mary's enrollment had grown to 101 students. Father Dubois was in great need of assistance. A newly ordained priest from Rennes, France, Father Simon Brute, was assigned to the Mount to help with running the school. He grew up during the, uh, the terror and it is said that he often accompanied uh, people to the uh, guillotine, and he stood there and watched as they went home to the Lord. A very strong man, but uh, frail looking. Actually, he was an MD, uh, quite a scholar. He was a great team with uh, Dubois. They were not at all alike, uh, but there was a complementarity there. Um, Dubois is extremely practical and, and uh, plain spoken, and, and uh, Brute was rather dreamy and uh, uh, ethereal. <laughs> 
Brute had a great sense of humility and zeal, earning him the title Angel of the Mountain. He became the spiritual director, not only for Mount St. Mary's, but for Mother Seton and her Sisters of Charity. He was really the confessor to the sisters and developed a deep spiritual relationship with Elizabeth Seton. They were kindred spirits. She helped him with his English, reviewed some of his sermons, perhaps gave him some pointers, and in turn, he provided spiritual direction. The sisters moved into the White House in the winter of 1810. Mother Seton was a pioneer educator, and on February 22nd of that year, the first pupils arrived at what would become St. Joseph's Academy and St. Joseph's Free School. The students came from the area who had no financial means of paying tuition first, and then in a few months, tuition-paying students came because it was very clear to Elizabeth Seton that she had to have an income, and that would have to come through tuition in order to conduct their charitable mission. Elizabeth always said, I want to prepare my students for the world in which they are destined to live. In her day, her vision that she was preparing good wives and mothers. Play with your darling. Aw, what do you say? Yeah. Father Brute perceived early on the sanctity of Mother Seton and instructed the sisters to save all of her writings. The mutual journey that the two shared in their journey of faith at Emmitsburg certainly has resulted ultimately in Elizabeth Seton's canonization. Simon Brute's cause for canonization has been introduced for consideration as well. In the early days of Mount St. Mary's, slavery was an established way of life in America, particularly in the South. Maryland was considered a border state, as it straddled both the North and the South, and the sale of slaves was both practiced and permitted by federal law. The students and founders of the Mount accepted this reality of American life and came to rely on it. One could rarely walk down the rural roads of the Monocacy Valley without the sight of slaves working in the fields. The college found itself eventually as uh, perhaps against its will, the owner of a certain number of slaves. Uh, parents who would send their sons here sometimes paid for tuition by hiring out a slave or even uh, donating a slave, if you will, to the college. Later, the college would decide that it was time to uh, refrain from all of this, and uh, over a 10 or 15 year period in the 1840s and 50s, uh, the people who were here at the college as slaves became free. As the Mount reflects with sadness upon this part of their history, they also remember with gratitude the countless contributions these men and women made to this new and struggling institution. 1826 was the end of an era for Mount St. Mary's. Father Dubois was appointed Bishop of New York City, leaving his beloved Mount to reside at the original St. Patrick's Cathedral. Dubois picked Father Michael Egan to be his successor, who affectionately was called the Little President because of his youth and stature. Among the seminarians who acted as teachers in the college were some of the best known names in American Catholic history. One of the most notable was John Hughes. John Hughes uh, had a great dream of being a priest, but he thought it was impossible. So what he did was get a job at Mount St. Mary's uh, and was the overseer, actually, of the fields and of the slaves. While Hughes was employed at the Mount, he lived in a small log cabin at the bottom of St. Mary's Mountain. Eventually, he confided his dream to Mother Seton, uh, 
and she interceded with Father Dubois uh, to get him into the uh, formation. He eventually becomes a priest. He was a priest of the Diocese of Philadelphia, but he gets made Bishop of uh, New York. Nicknamed Dagger John because he signed his name with an exceptionally dark cross, this native Irishman was constantly defending the Catholic religion against the Protestant majority. Hughes was a firebrand, a marvelous speaker. He uh, loved to take people on in public disputation. And uh, it's at the height of the know-nothing difficulties where there's great antipathy between the uh, uh, Protestant establishment and the immigrant Catholics. And he jumps right into the fray. Bishop Hughes establishes St. John's College in the Bronx, later to be called Fordham University, and appoints Father John McCloskey, his former classmate at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, as the first president of the school. Foreseeing the need for a larger cathedral in New York, Hughes proposed the daring vision to build a new church. The proposed site was considered to be in the middle of nowhere, and the idea was ridiculed as Hughes' folly. But nothing was to derail Hughes from this lofty dream. Through the generosity of 103 citizens who pledged $1,000 each and the collective pennies of thousands of largely Irish immigrant poor, Hughes' vision became a reality. The cornerstone of the new St. Patrick's Cathedral was laid in 1858. He's also there at the time of the Civil War when the draft riots take place, which were violent rioting for three nights in the city of New York, tremendous destruction. And though he's dying of Bright's disease, he comes out on the balcony of his Episcopal residence and talks to the, the um, immigrants to try to calm them down and stop the carnage. He dies very soon after that. John McCloskey succeeded Hughes as prelate of New York and went on to become the first Roman Catholic cardinal in America. He assumed the task of completing St. Patrick's, and after weeks of fundraising efforts through the great cathedral fair held in 1878, presided over the dedication the following year. In 1858, Mount St. Mary's celebrated their golden jubilee. Father John McCaffrey had presided over the school for the past 20 years and had maintained a robust enrollment of approximately 200 students per year. More than half of these young men came from below the Mason-Dixon line. Prior to the Civil War, the Catholic Church was largely a Southern institution, and that shocks people. But uh, the best schools, the best families, the most influential people, the best academies, the best seminaries were in the South, below the Mason-Dixon line, if you will. So the Mount was thriving, as was uh, most of the South, thriving before the Civil War. But by 1860, things began to change. Threats of war were becoming increasingly ominous, and parents were fearful for the safety of their sons as the Confederate forces were getting closer and closer to the school. On April 13, 1861, the Confederate Army fired upon Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. In an immediate response, President Lincoln called up 75,000 troops. Riots broke out in Baltimore protesting Lincoln's action, and the Maryland Assembly proclaimed the state to be neutral in the dispute between the federal government and the southern states. To quell this insurgency, Lincoln placed Baltimore under martial law, and citizens of Maryland with pro-southern sympathies would be imprisoned without regard to the writ of habeas corpus. This did not stop the young men, however, from expressing their sentiments with their feet. Some 90 men from Baltimore left to enlist in the Virginia Infantry. Among them were several former students from the Mount. The first major battle was fought at Manassas, Virginia on July 21st, 1861. By the end of that summer, the Maryland-Virginia border was essentially an armed camp. One of the young men in the U.S. Cavalry was Mount alumnus Thomas Anderson. Tom was from Ohio, and like so many from that state, fiercely loyal to the Union. 
and had little or no tolerance for debate on this matter. In a letter to a professor at the Mount, he inquired, why, my dear sir, I wish to ask you, are we, the federal army, considered the enemies? I hear the Catholics of the state are most anxious to subvert the government of their fathers. Cannot the Catholics of the North and South remain loyal to their old government as to their old faith? It would appear from this letter that Mount St. Mary's pro-Southern views were no secret. Father McCaffrey was openly sympathetic to the Southern cause and had gained some notoriety by being so. McCaffrey uh, eventually and some of his professors were monitored, observed by President Lincoln's loyalty police. And these were men appointed all over the country to keep an eye on folks who might be or were suspected of being Confederate sympathizers. The issue of being a Southern sympathizer was a problem for the students as well as for the faculty. When the Civil War broke out, there was an immediate problem for some students here on campus, or at least in the eyes of their parents, uh, you were expected, if you were going to remain in the North, to be a loyal citizen of the Union. And that was a problematic uh, issue for some Southern boys or men, we might call them, who were here. Uh, some of these people were receiving letters from their parents saying, come home, you know, Maryland is now in foreign territory. It's not part of the Confederacy. We want you back here. Some perhaps uh, were willing to stay for all of that, but were worried that they would be perceived as Southern in sympathy. And of course, that could lead to your being uh, put in custody. Uh, you might have ended up spending the war at Fort McHenry in Baltimore, as a number of Confederate sympathizers in that town did. In the fall of 1862, the second school year of the war, the battles between the North and South were getting closer to the Mount's campus. Enrollment had dropped to only 67 students, a disastrous situation for a school whose fixed costs required a substantially higher number of students in attendance. Father McCaffrey did his best to assure the parents of the safety of their boys. In a letter to a parent dated September 10, 1862, McCaffrey states, They, the Confederates, are bound most strictly to respect persons and property. The orders under which they move are in fact that the first man caught stealing, robbing, or committing any outrage or molesting any citizen shall be shot dead. The Sisters of Charity, whose mother house is so near us, have from the beginning of the war nursed the sick and wounded in both armies and are venerated and loved by both. Their identity of religion and intimate relations with us are an additional security. In early September 1862, Confederate General Robert E. Lee decided to cross the Potomac River and enter into federal territory. Their hopes at that time were that uh, they could win a victory on Maryland's soil and perhaps persuade Marylanders to, uh, to join the Confederacy. Maryland had stayed in the Union, clearly had some Confederate sympathizers. Lee hoped to change minds. The Union Army under General George McClellan pursued the Confederates on their march to Frederick, Maryland. On September 14, 1862, both armies clashed in the Battle of South Mountain, which was only 15 miles from the Mount campus. Sounds of war could be plainly heard at the college. Students here at the college knew about the campaign. There were troops in the area for a week or so before the battle. A few days later, the fighting continued. 40,000 Confederates were pitted against 87,000 Union soldiers. The fighting began at dawn. fierce and fatal. The slain lay in rows, precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. Union General Joseph Hooker, Antietam. 
the Battle of Antietam was the single bloodiest day in American history. When the fighting ended, 23,000 men were dead or wounded. The battle was a victory for the Union forces and changed the course of the Civil War. It gave President Lincoln the opportunity he needed to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, the war had a dual purpose, to preserve the Union and to end slavery in the South. So close to the mountain was the battle that six of the seven seniors in the college left the campus and visited the battlefield shortly after the fight. Their curiosity could not have prepared them for the horror they were to behold. Nothing but morbid curiosity could induce anyone but those whose duty calls them to look upon so horrible a sight as disfigured, bloated, and in a few hours, blackened bodies. Bernie McNeil's letter to his uncle, Father McCaffrey. When the boys returned three days later, they were expelled. Father McCaffrey's reaction was understandable, as several students had left the week before and attempted to enlist. McCaffrey relented in his punishment, however, as three weeks later, all six were back in class. The impact of this experience must have been significant for these young men, for five of the six eventually became priests. The mountain was attempting to get back into somewhat of a routine, when in October 1862, General Jeb Stuart, the Confederacy's most famous cavalry leader, crossed the Potomac and started north. He was heading toward Pennsylvania in hopes of replenishing his Confederate horses. On reaching Chambersburg, his men found arms, ammunition, and military clothing. They looted the stores, then destroyed and burned what they left behind. Leaving Chambersburg, they turned and headed for Gettysburg. Just shy of Gettysburg, Stuart turned south and decided to ride through Emmitsburg. He was accompanied by 1,800 troops and 1,200 horses. The Union Army was in close pursuit, so they continued on to Frederick, passing the mount along the way. The proximity of the troops caused quite a stir at the mount as well. Father McCloskey, the school's vice president, rode for several miles alongside of General Stewart. Great excitement and fanfare greeted the troops as they rode through small towns. The people here seemed to be intensely Southern in their sympathies and omitted no opportunity to show us attention during the short time we passed among them. Eighteen sixty three began with a growing concern over the Mount's increasing debt. The northern and southern armies were hampered by harsh winter weather and waited until spring to begin further movement. By late spring, problems on campus had the attention of faculty and students at the Mount. Maurice Byrne, a fifteen year old student from Louisiana, was arrested on school grounds by a detail of Union troops. Maurice Byrne, by order of the Provost Marshal of the Military District of Frederick County, I place you under arrest for sedition. Byrne's offense was that he had written a letter to his father expressing his Southern loyalties. It was intercepted by Union officials. Let's go. Byrne could not be released unless he signed an oath of loyalty to the Union. He refused. Father McCaffrey reacted immediately. My dear President Lincoln, a most unfortunate incident has occurred on our campus. One of our students, Maurice Byrne, was arrested by a detail of your Union troops for a letter he wrote to his father. As a father yourself of a 15-year-old son, I hope you will understand his natural sympathies for his Southern heritage. The effort worked, and Byrne was released to the custody of Father McCaffrey. In the spring of 1863, graduation was held early 
as troops were on the move all around Emmitsburg. Students were hurriedly sent home. Those who stayed witnessed the northward movement of supply trains in covered wagons on every road in the area. The rush of the artillery and worn out stragglers became daily sights as the Union and Confederate soldiers set up their camps. The days preceding the battle were tense and tedious. Strategies of war consumed every thought and conversation. I think the next parts are going to attack is in the center. They have very good interior lines. Bring up some fresh artillery, put it behind the stone wall, and we'll wait them out and see what they're going to do. Any questions, gentlemen? No, sir. Very good. To your post. On the morning of July 1st, 1863, the fighting began. Soldiers marched into battle with pride and trepidation. In order to defeat an army uh, in the field, you had to mass as many men as you possibly could, uh, shoulder to shoulder, uh, to fire and hit the men at the other side, to hit anything at all because most of the shots were not going directly where they were aimed, so you had to get this massive volume of fire. The fighting was relentless and lasted for three days. The casualties were in the thousands. The units were formed in, in hometowns. Brothers, uh, best friends, cousins. They, they're childhood friends that they grew up with that they fought side by side. And suddenly you'll hear the thud and this crack of bone. And the man beside you falls. And you turn and it's your brother. But you can't stop and help him. You've got a duty to all the other men. You're praying that he's still alive and, and is not mortally wounded. But the only way for you to help him is to continue on across the field and break the Union lines. And hopefully a stretcher bearers will come and take him away. Makeshift hospitals were assembled at various locations throughout the region. Both the Union and uh, Confederate soldiers, I think, were cared for equally. It was then a matter of humanity. They went that bandage down, okay? Surgeons were considered non-combatants. They were only repairers of war machines, I guess. And if a man went down, that was it. If they were hurt, they were hurt, and we took care of them. If the Union lines happened to overrun a Confederate hospital, the first thing that happened was the Union surgeon went to the Confederate surgeon and said, how may I help you? And the same the other way around. There was a lot of exchange of information. We would work together. Drastic measures for many was the only recourse for survival. This is a 58 caliber mini ball. They were close to an ounce of lead, and the mass of this doesn't change. But what it hit mostly was in the arms or the legs, because that's mostly what you saw with the way they were standing. And when it hit a bone, the, the points kind of push back and they mushroom out. They get about the size of a quarter, and they just break up everything in front of them. These bones were so devastatingly broken that that was the answer, it was to amputate. The process is actually very quick, anywhere between five and 15 minutes, depending upon where the amputation is. 75% of the same individuals today would probably still be candidates for amputation. Wake him up and take him out of here. Even with the technology that we have, because it shattered that badly. The Sisters of Charity at Mother Seton's convent in Emmitsburg came to minister to the wounded and dying. The sisters uh, were called to, to nurse at Gettysburg, um, not in the height of the battle, but as the battle wore down and uh, there were so many of the uh, wounded to be taken care of. They describe in their letters uh, the, the dreadful uh, carnage that they witnessed. We soon came in sight of war's ravages, 
The rains had filled the roads with water, and here it was red with blood. Our carriage wheels rolling through blood. Our horses could hardly be made to proceed on account of the horrid objects lying about them. Dead men and horses here and there. When the battle was over, there were more than 50,000 soldiers killed, maimed, or missing. It took weeks, even months, to clear the carnage from the battlefields. Mount student J.A. Parker. I saw many soldiers with their hands and feet sticking out of the ground. I do not say out of their graves, for they had none, but were buried, if they were, where they lay, by throwing a little dirt over their bodies. There was very little fighting that occurred near the Mount's campus following the Battle of Gettysburg. But the scars of war left behind were deep and tangible. There's three boys buried in our cemetery who were killed during the Civil War. One of them by the name of Maurice Byrne, a farmer found his body and contacted uh, Mount St. Mary's. I think he was wearing a cross. He couldn't go back to Louisiana, so they buried him here up on the mountain. But the Civil War really devastated this part of the country. Following the war, Father McCaffrey, after four years of official neutrality, took an oath of allegiance to the United States and continued to manage the affairs of the college. The years following the Civil War were difficult beyond imagination. President Lincoln was dead. Families and communities were torn apart. Mount St. Mary's was close to bankrupt. It was a very, very bad time. The reconstruction was a very tough time for Mount St. Mary's. They were nearly bankrupt. The school nearly closed. There's no question about it. After the Civil War, uh, Western Maryland had largely ceased to be any kind of a particular growth area. And uh, Emmitsburg had, I suppose, peaked at the 2,000 or so people that it now has today. Similar things were happening throughout this region. It was kind of settling down into being uh, just sort of uh, rural Western Maryland. One of the most innovative and versatile American artists of the 19th century began his career here in Western Maryland. John Lafarge, who was renowned for his works in watercolor, oil, stained glass, and opalescent glass, graduated and received honorary degrees from Mount St. Mary's. While on campus, he spent a great deal of his time sketching caricature-style portraits of various professors, to the great delight of students and faculty. After completing his degrees in 1855, he went on to practice law, and study with various artists around the world, gaining international acclaim. His works are currently displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Yale University, and Mount St. Mary's. Play ball! Baseball appeared on the American scene in the mid-1800s. Professional baseball began in 1869 with the Cincinnati Red Stockings, and professional leagues were soon to follow. At the Mount, intramural baseball was quite popular by the late 1870s. The first intercollegiate games as we know them today, however, did not exist until the 1880s. The early Mount Nine had to purchase their own uniforms and do their own scheduling. Games away from the school were rare, and the team had to be back on campus by the end of the day. Success came early to the Mountaineers. Bernard Bradley, catcher on the 1888 club, was to later become the treasurer and then president of the Mount. It was he who designed and executed the building of Echo Field. <laughs> 
Home games attracted large crowds. At one such game on Echo Field in 1911, when the Mount played against a Baltimore industrial school, legend tells us that George Herman Ruth was discovered by a professional scout. The Babe would return numerous times to the Mount in the years that followed. Football was introduced as a sport on campus in 1891. Play before the turn of the century resembled rugby more than today's college football. The early teams were very successful with competitors such as Gettysburg, Baltimore City College, Georgetown, and the University of Maryland. Boxing, tennis, and track were soon to follow. But it was the game of basketball that was to make Mount history. The sport came to the campus in 1903, when baskets were nailed to the walls of Flynn Hall. The first intercollegiate team was formed in 1910, and it wasn't long before it seemed the Mountaineers were winning everything in sight. In a 25-year stretch, they captured no less than nine state or league crowns and experienced only four losing seasons. By the late 1800s, the Mount was beginning to thrive once again. Enrollment was up. Students paid $150 per year for room, board, and tuition. With the average American earning less than $10 per week, Mountaineers were well aware of the privilege they possessed. New buildings appeared on campus. Flynn Hall, a gymnasium that was then among the best in the country, opened in 1903. In 1906, the seminary moved into their own building. And the following year, ground was broken for the Immaculate Conception Chapel. Nineteen oh eight marked the one hundredth anniversary of the founding of the college. For two days in October, students, alumni, and friends came from all parts of the country to celebrate the occasion and give thanks for all who labored so hard before them. The Roaring Twenties, an era sometimes referred to as the Jazz Age or the age of wonderful nonsense, embodied the beginning of modern America. Henry Ford's Model T cars appeared on the roads, and radios found their way into every home in America. Frightened investors ordered their brokers to sell at whatever the price. It would have been impossible to have imagined the fear and suffering the end of the decade would bring. market crashed. the collapse of the United States economic system would follow. Thousands of banks were forced to close, and one-third of the American population had no income whatsoever. Most of the Mount students came from large families, many whose fathers had lost their jobs. A cash-stretched college that somehow managed to operate on an annual budget of $100,000 was still able to provide two-thirds of the student body with financial assistance. In return, students and seminarians spent time working in the fields on Mount St. Mary's farm. The screeching sirens on a serene Sunday morning signaled the success of a carefully planned Japanese attack. In a matter of hours, the entire U.S. Pearl Harbor fleet was destroyed, and 2,400 Americans were dead. The United States was at war. World War II caused the all-male enrollment of the Mount to shrink rapidly. By the end of the 1941-42 school year, there were scarcely 50 civilian students remaining on campus. Fortunately, the Mount was chosen as a training site for Navy deck officers and aviation cadets. The CAA War Training Service School opened in July 1942. 
The Mount would set aside 50 acres of their property for an airstrip on the flat lands east of Highway 15. By the time the last class was held in 1945, 1,358 Navy personnel had been educated in some way at the Mount. World War II came to an end. Euphoria was in the streets. Soldiers returned home and married their sweethearts. The years that followed were peaceful and prosperous. The American generations that had been traumatized by the Great Depression and two world wars set about creating a culture of conformity. In 1958, Mount St. Mary's celebrated their 150th anniversary. Graduation ceremonies heralded the occasion. Special guests and alumni returned to campus. A young Robert Kennedy, who would later become the country's attorney general, gave the baccalaureate address. And President Eisenhower brought national attention to the school by giving the commencement address. Eisenhower was familiar with the campus as he would pass by the front gate on innumerable trips to and from Camp David. Rock and roll was the music of the times, and baby boomers were coming of age. Radios and record players were all it took to have a party. And despite the all-male population, the proximity to St. Joseph's College for Women provided for frequent female guests on campus. Coats and ties were required dress for class, and weekend activities ended in curfews. But for the all-male student body living on a country campus with very few cars, it was sports that became a huge part of their campus life. Basketball was, uh, was incredible. The, playing the Memorial Gymnasium, uh, maybe 2,500 students, uh, you always, and was always packed, everybody from the community, from the seminary, from the town. We were uh, very good very good division town and well respected around the country. As a matter of fact, every year we went to the NC2As. So they, they know we were coming in to win. When I got here, I was extremely fortunate to have a very good group of players. And uh, when you start that way, you can kind of get the ball rolling. And we kind of kept rolling for quite a long time. Basically, championship teams in every decade. We had them in the 50s, we had them in the 60s, we had them in the 70s, we had them in the 80s, we had them in the 90s. It was in 1962, in Evansville, Indiana, that the Mount made sports history. In a 58-57 overtime game with Sacramento State, Mount St. Mary's won the NCAA National Championship. It was tremendously exciting. It was, you know, once in a lifetime, you don't often get a chance to win a national championship. Coach Phelan was a legend. He was great to play for because he was a player's coach. Coach Phelan had coached more college basketball than anyone in the history of the sport. He had amassed 830 victories, ranking him fourth in the history of the NCAA. Basketball wasn't the only sport to gain national and international recognition at the Mount. Where I am. This Coach Deegan spent 50 years building the Mount track and field program, developing world-class athletes. Next year, uh, we're celebrating 100 years of our, our centennial of track and field. We, we're very fortunate that we've had 11 athletes uh, competing in Olympic Games starting in 1984. Most of them were international students. I think I've had 100, 100 All-American athletes. <laughs> it's just like well, something that you don't expect from a school of our size. The late 60s and 70s were a time of social change and civil unrest. The Vietnam War had intensified. 
protests and peace rallies became common events. Clothes and hairdos were a sign of the times. Throughout the country, single-sex colleges declined in popularity. 1972 is when the young women arrived on campus, when uh, St. Joe's closed in Emmitsburg. Uh, the Mount went co-ed. And I arrived at the Mount in 1978, and there were very few women on campus at that time. Attitudes and that sort of thing were very male. But interestingly, when I think back on those days, there was considerable sensitivity, making sure that women were a part of the conversation. The seminary has remained an integral part of the Mount St. Mary's community since it was founded in conjunction with the college back in 1808. We're the second oldest uh, and also today the second largest seminary in the nation. We have about 2,600 priests who have graduated in the 200 years uh, that Mount St. Mary Seminary has existed. We also have developed a relationship with a number of Hispanic-speaking countries. Almost 30% of our men now are non-native English-speaking seminarians. We don't form professors, we don't form real missionaries, we form parish priests. Uh, and it was founded by parish priests to form parish priests. Over the decades, seminarians have had the rare privilege of being inspired by the actual presence on campus of a canonized saint, as well as those in the canonization process. Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, came here to pray and to visit with the seminarians. In fact, when I was a seminarian here in the 1970s, uh, it was the first time that she came here. Join me in welcoming to Mount St. Mary's, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa would return once again to the Mount in 1995. And my prayer for you is that you really grow in holiness by loving one another as God loves each one of you. As the Mount enters its third century, one sees striking changes in the classrooms and on the campus. Computers and cell phones have replaced pens and paper. Women are no longer in the minority. The student body celebrates its diversity. And as graduate programs grew, the Mount changed from a college to a university. We have the undergraduate college, uh, we have our Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes, and then we have our seminary. And that university is meant to represent that trilogy coming together of all three parts that are equally important in this whole that we call the university. The lore and majesty of St. Mary's Mountain is as much alive today as it was 200 years ago. A chapel now stands where Dubois discovered the first grotto, a giant tree whose roots were large enough to shelter a full-grown man. It was he who placed a wooden cross inside this tree. And Brute, who cleared the land, creating a path to this sacred spot the same path that visitors walk today. It was here that Mother Seton came every Sunday to Mass at St. Mary's Chapel, traveling from St. Joseph's Valley across Tom's Creek to the mountaintop, where she and her sisters would spend the day teaching and taking time for personal prayer. As the decades have passed, the face of the grotto would change as seminarians and collegians would continue Brute's work of beautifying this special place. In the late 1800s, the grotto was dedicated to Our Lady of Lourdes. <laughs> 
But it was not until the 1960s that it became a national shrine that would be open to the public. The spot is clearly marked for all who pass Mount St. Mary's campus by the Pangborn Campanile, dedicated in 1965 under the direction of Monsignor Hugh Phillips. Today, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world come to visit this shrine, finding there the same peace and solitude that Dubois experienced so many years ago. Near the grotto is the Mountain Cemetery, bearing the resting places of many who were so integral to the early history of the mountain and the valley below. And while the landscape has changed, the spirit of the school has remained the same.